Hello, everybody. This is Rick Manning, President of Americans for Limited Government, joining you today um, from beautiful Fairfax, Virginia, where we are enjoying a nice sunny day and uh, a little chilly, but not too bad. The um, you know, one, there's something really interesting that came across the uh, my email today, and I wanted to share it with people because it was, I think it's really tells a story of where we really are in the country. And it's a, a, a CBS News poll um, that was conducted by YouGov. Um, the sample size was 2,062 adults um, in the United States, which means its margin of error is like 2.8%, which is extremely low. This was a really, really large sample size. Usually, even on the, on the polls that you see, um, even close to the election, there are a it's 1,000 people. Now, this was adults as opposed to registered voters which does make it a little bit broader than I normally like um, because there's three categories. One is all adults, one is uh, registered voters and the other, and the last one is likely voters. So it is a little bit uh, deceiving in that regard, but um, I think we can learn something about it. At this point in history, at this point where we are in the election cycle, going likely voters or even registered voters is somewhat of, of, a, of a gamble um, because the fact of the matter is, at this point, it's not about voters, it's about people, it's about America. So uh, this little poll by CBS News, um, obviously not a conservative outlet, um, really tells us a lot. Um, first question, getting it right out of the box, is like uh, whack right in the, between the eyes. It's generally speaking, how do you, do you feel things in America today are going? Only 7% said very well. 7% very badly was 33%, somewhat badly was 33%, and somewhat well was 27%. Two thirds of the country, two thirds of the country answered in this poll that things are going somewhat or very badly in America. That's devastating for an incumbent. Um, two, how would you rate the condition of the national economy? And so, you know, we remember back in the when Bill Clinton was running against um, George H. W. Bush, and his campaign manager Paul Pagala famously said, "It's the economy, stupid," and because we were in a minor a minor recession, um, and it was a um, and so in that minor recession, people who had you know basically said, "Well, we really we've had twelve years of Reagan and Bush, and we want something new." And things aren't going that great, so we're going to throw out uh, Bush, even though, like nine months before the election, he had a favorable rating of about eighty percent. So you know, things change rapidly in presidential politics, but um, so you know, take all that with a grain of salt. But how would you rate the condition of the national economy? Very good, nine percent. Seeing a pattern here, um, fairly good, twenty-two percent. So you get. 31% who say very good or fairly good. Very bad is 31%. So the total number of people who view the economy as being either very good or fairly good is the same number as the people who view it as being very bad. And then fairly bad is 32% with 6% not sure. Once again, being upside down, 63 to 31 on that question is... It's incredible. It's 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 as bad as anything I've ever seen. Um, do you approve or disapprove of the way Joe Biden is handling his job as president? Well, Joe Biden does a little bit better here. Only four, you know, only fifty eight percent disapprove and forty two percent approve. So he's doing a little better on the job approval, even though people think he's generally doing a pretty crummy. The oh, Biden's America is, is people are pretty down on it. Um, and then lastly, the, the before I get to the real part, um, do you strongly somewhat or strongly somewhat approve or strongly somewhat disapprove of the way Joe Biden is handling his job as president? This this is the breakout. Strongly approves 19 percent. Strongly disapprove is 39 percent. More than double people strongly disapprove over strongly approve. That that's a. And then the people in the middle, um, 23 somewhat approved, 19 somewhat disapproved. It's a, 
it's the extreme numbers that tell intensity, that tell how you really feel. Because the people who are, have those extreme, who are on one side or the other, they're the ones who are going to go vote for guaranteed for sure. The ones in the middle, the somewhat, somewhat approves, somewhat disapproves, those are really swings. So you have to make a case uh, for them to go vote. And Joe Biden is facing a, almost, the Democrats in particular are facing a uh, almost insurmountable obstacle where they have to get everybody who somewhat approves and everybody who strongly approves to combine to, to basically reach, just be a little bit over the level of people who strongly disapprove the way things are going, or, of, of Joe Biden's job approval. That's, folks, he, he's not doing well. Um, do you approve or disapprove of the way Joe Biden is handling the economy? 37% say they approve it, 63% disapprove. Inflation. 31% say they approve it. 69% say they disapprove. So, you know, big surprise. Inflation, um, the price of the pump is uh, is driving a lot of uh, a lot of the people. Um, situation with Russia and Ukraine, 45%, 55% disapprove. Immigration, 38% approve, 62% disapprove. Uh, climate change, 43% approve, 57 disapprove. And crime, 39% approved, 61% approved. So now the one issue that Joe Biden does do well on is their rating of how he's doing handling the coronavirus outbreak, largely because the coronavirus outbreak has um, is kind of worked its way through the system. And cities and counties and, and states, Democrat cities and counties and states have finally opened up their economies. So people aren't feeling as much of a pinch on it even though it's disconcerting to go in and see, see a bunch of people wearing masks when you're going into a restaurant or something. Um, it is a, um, he does have very good 24%, very bad 25%, um, somewhat good 29%, somewhat bad 22%. So on the extremes, it's a tie. In the middle, it's the, people say it's somewhat good uh, because quite honestly, things are better now in terms of coronavirus than a year and a half ago. Now, is that Joe Biden? Does Joe Biden have anything to do with that? No, but that is just that is a fact. Um, now, here's the question that made me want to do this thing and, and talk to you about this because I think it's it really does show how far Washington D.C. is out of touch. People are asked, rate how much of a priority each of these issues for the country to are for the country to exist, to address. So these are the one the ratings. What percentage of people think that something is a high priority? Now recognize it doesn't have to add up to a hundred percent. When you get the whole list, it's not going to be a hundred percent. It's just what people think of as a high priority. And I'm going to read from the bottom up, and I think you'll you'll you won't be surprised what what happens. Coronavirus outbreak. This is the one issue that Joe Biden breaks even on. Okay, remember, it's the one issue he breaks even on. High priorities, 39%. Medium priorities, 36%. Low priority, 24%. So the people who really care about it, half are on Joe Biden's side and half are on the, are, are on the uh, think he's doing a bad job. That's your, you know, I think that's what you can drive from that. Crime. 59% say crime is a high priority, and 33% say it's a medium priority, and 8% say it's a low priority, which is a third lowest uh, number for people who claim, say that uh, something is a low priority is crime. Climate change. Now, this is you know where Joe Biden's bread and butter. These are the this is where Joe Biden uh, is hanging his hat. The entire uh, attack on fossil fuels is built around climate change, electric vehicles, and all that. 39% of Americans say climate change is a high priority. 39%. That is tied, tied for the lowest number with coronavirus outbreak. 29% say it's medium priority, and 14% say it's low priority. So while the Democrats can say, gee, this is a priority for America, of course, you can't read when it says cli climate change if they're saying, you know, what the what the actual policy prescriptions are. But while they would say, well, you know, 86% of the people 
are in favor of, uh, I think, uh, climate change is a priority. The fact is, as a high priority, it is tied for last on this list of seven different issues. Um, immigration, this one, the immigration numbers kind of surprised me. It really shows that people have, uh, don't really realize, aren't, aren't, don't have any idea what's really going on at the border, which is an education problem. Um, but high priority, 48%. Medium priority, 38%. Low priority, 14%. Um, I really expected immigration to be higher uh, because, but, you know, that's, I, I think as people start, if we start getting any pictures from the border, again, you know, the kind of people in cells and all that stuff, the, you know, I think we'll get that, but don't expect the media to, to provide um, any pictures like that or, or, push any around. Um, situation with Russia and Ukraine, 58% say it's a high priority, 30% medium priority, 12% low. Um, remember, he did, he did, he was only underwater 10% on Ukraine. So it's a, and so that's like his second best issue. Um, inflation, 73% say it's a high priority, 22% say it's medium priority, 5% say low priority. Economy, 76% say high priority, medium priority, 21%, low priority, 3%. Now, let's go back up and you know, just remember, when you look at the, when you look at how people believe Joe Biden's doing, and, and this, this goes to the Democrats, the Democrats eat all the Joe Biden numbers because he's in their party. And so whatever, the transference, people don't necessarily know their congressman, congressperson, their senator, but they do know what party they are. And if they're affiliated and lined up with the, a president who they don't like or don't think is doing a job, the that party eats the, eats the results. Um, so what do we have? Um, just as a reminder, now, what are the highest issues in priority? Economy and inflation. Well, what is Joe Biden's number on economy? 37% approved, 63% disapproved. Inflation, 31% approved, 69% disapproved. On the two issues that are the most, the most important, and they're really the same issue, um, Joe, Biden is, uh, Joe Biden is doing worse. Uh, those are his two worst issues, and yet he's uh, really doing poorly on them. You get down, um, immigration is 38-62. Um, Actually, hold on. Um, so you look at some of these numbers and you wouldn't want to be on crime. He's underwater, dramatically underwater. On immigration, he's dramatically underwater. Um, so you have a, uh, a poll here which shows that Joe Biden isn't doing anything on the people, on what the people actually want him to do something on. His priorities, climate change, his priority of opening up the border, his priority of um you know, we're going to just keep, uh, we're just going to close our eyes and, and inflation is going to go away. We're going to pretend it doesn't exist. Um, those are not what people want. And the truth is, there really is very little that a president, once inflation starts hitting an economy and becomes embedded in an economy, it's very, there's very little a president can do about it. And as a result, the opportunity to deal with inflation was last year when rather than spending a bunch of money and flooding the, sending out helicopter checks to everybody, sending money to everybody and say, hey, free money. If they hadn't done that, inflation wouldn't be where it is today. It wouldn't be a, ma a major issue. And you still have supply chain problems, but that's something the government can do something about. But this one apparently doesn't want to, but you, the government can do something about that. But the, the bottom line is they already spent the money that creates inflation. And they're going to spend more money this year that creates inflation. You know, we had a five point, Biden came out with 5.7 billion, you know, billion dollar, trillion dollar bu uh, budget. Um, two trillion more, more than two trillion more than what the budget was, what was actually spent two years ago. Um, absent, not talking about any of the coronavirus, any of the extra expenditures. The so we're raising the, the spending tremendously, um, but Joe Biden's going to talk about lowering the budget deficit. Why? Because we're not doing the extra spending. 
But even under those circumstances, there's a bill in Congress that Joe Biden supports that would increase spending, coronavirus spending, by $40 billion. Extra money. Just extra money. Let's see, we're going to just keep spending. Um, so just understand, it's a, uh, the budget, the, all the talk about budget deficit and cutting the budget deficit is all illusory. Um, over 10 years, they talked about, oh, we're going to cut the budget deficit by a trillion dollars. Well, folks, that's a pittance. I mean, that's a pittance. That's that's not even trying. And the whole re way they're going to cut it is they're, they're hoping everybody will remain employed. We won't have any economic downturns. And they will continue to get uh, revenue increases because people are paying taxes because they're employed. Fact of the matter is when people are employed, they do pay taxes, your revenues go up, but also your spending goes down on things like food stamps, unemployment insurance, and a whole set of so social safety net programs. Um, but the Democrats have increased the, the eligibility on those programs, to, and that offsets some of the spending savings that should exist from people not needing those programs. So the budget deficit is not going to go away, it's gonna go up, and the, we keep spending more money than we have, folks. Inflation is not going to go away. It's a, one of the other, and I'm just going to go and say, one of the other things that is noticeable here is most people say that they've only, that they haven't altered their, what they do all that much due to inflation, due to gas prices. Um, they have, you know, they're not driving as much, um, but they're not having, you know, inflation hasn't caused uh, most people to sit there and say, um, I'm going to have to go buy different things at the grocery store, at least according to this poll. I will tell you an attitude thing that's, cha that's changing to me is going to restaurants is too expensive. And so, you know, it's a, uh, I mean, all the restaurant prices have gone up so, so dramatically that it's just, you know, going to the re restaurants is going to become much, I'm going to do that a whole lot less because quite honestly, it's just dramatically more expensive than it used to be. Um, but those are, so they might drive less. You can look at the leisure, they're cutting back on leisure, which means a, what was supposed to be a really good vacation season this year. That was anticipated um, with a higher price of, of airline tickets, um, with the you know higher price in hotels and, and various uh accommodations around the country, higher costs of restaurants and the higher costs of driving. I think a lot of company, a lot of uh, people are going to make or do staycations this year, um, even though they desperately want to go somewhere. Um, it may be a visit to grandma's house and staying at grandma's house rather than going to, um, let's say, Universal Studios um, down in uh, Orlando or in, in, or in L.A. So those are your, so those are some of the takeaways on this. Or right, the bottom line on it is, is if I were a Democrat political consultant, I would be absolutely scrambling away from this president, and they're, yet they're doing anything but that. I would be, I would be challenging him left and right on all sorts of issues. Um, even if it's a, an issue like immigration, where Biden policy is effectively opening the gate, the floodgates of illegal immigration to the country. I think that that would be a, um, so expect, if, if Democrats have any survival instinct, expect them to start really scrambling away from this president's agenda. And what that means overall is that President Biden's presidency from a policy perspective is dead. Um, he, he, he's not going to pass, it'd be very unusual for him to pass any big measures here on, from here on out. Um, if the, these polls hold, Republicans will have control in the House or Senate. How much of control will depend on how, uh, if Republicans actually want to pass anything and want to do anything, or if they just want to say, I'm not that guy. Um, my, my feeling is that probably Sam just go with, I'm not that guy, which will, uh, lessen some of the enthusiasm for them, um, but the enthusiasm to vote against the other the other guys is going to be extremely high, and this is a this is as bad of a poll as I've ever seen. So recognize it's adults in the United States. It's not registered voters. It's not likely registered voters. 
but also recognize adults in the United States, when they poll everybody, the results tend to be more liberal, more left of center. Um, and when you get to registered voters, it tends to be um, pretty much down the middle of what you'd expect. And likely voters is when you is a measure of intensity, who's coming out to vote. Um, are Republicans or Democrats or, you know, Republican leaning independents um, coming out to vote? And so your likely voter is all about who's coming out to vote. And these numbers tell me if you're a Democrat, there's nobody coming out to vote for you because they're really kind of mad at you in all the different ways. So this is a, and I wouldn't have even worried, brought this poll to your attention, but I think I'll get lost. And this is CBS News. Now, once again, it's not Rasmussen. It's, I mean, I like I like Rasmussen. I, I know him. I like him. Um, but it gets that kind of gets discounted as being Republican polling. This is not Republican polling. This is far left polling um, by CBS News. YouGov is a, uh, you know, they are notorious for, for over polling Democrats and over sam over sampling uh, the left. Now, being all adults, they have they had samples. They had people ways of weighting the poll. Um, but it, if this is a typical YouGov poll, it's about five percent off to the left. So it's even worse, is not what I'm saying. So with that, I'm going to go back to the. Uh, I'm going to go back to where we are in terms of you guys. Um, the uh, yeah, the student loans for you. Earl, that's a really, really good point. Um, there are a significant, you know, the, it's really interesting. Joe Biden pushes back again uh, when people have to start repaying their student loans and he gets grief from the, the student loan people who are desperately want to have their student loan forgiven. And at the same time, he, you know, so everybody's mad at him about it. And it's it's really kind of you know being a, being in the you know the yellow line in the middle of the road. There's old saying in the South that the only thing in the middle of the road are a yellow line and dead skunks. Well, in this case, Joe Biden's being a dead skunk on that on that issue. I don't want him to forgive them. I think it's a disastrous issue for him. If you want to tell blue collar America exactly what you think of them, forgive the student loans for Biff and Buffy, um, and say, well, gee whiz, Blue Collar America, you pay for their student loans. You, you didn't go to college. You didn't, you didn't get to four or five, six years of college. Um, you went out and you worked your, and you, you worked. And you, you're working for everything you have. Um, you have nothing given to you. You're, a lot of people, when you go to a high school reunion, look down at you because you didn't go to college. And yet you're the one who's building the, the country. You're the one who's mining the minerals. You're the ones who, who nail, hammer the nails. You're the ones who are, uh, who are running the lathes. You're the ones who are, who are making the parts for automobiles. It's not people who went to college. And it's a, um, and so yeah, you wanna create massive resentment amongst blue collar workers, um, do that. I think it's a, it really is the, um, is an end point for the Democrats um, because you know what? Biff and Buffy, oh, you know, some of them are gonna vote for them and some of them are not. The ones who are gonna cheer the most about getting their student loans forgiven would have voted for them anyway. And the ones who say, okay, well, if those are the rules, I'll take it, but I don't necessarily think it's right. It's a debt that I, I, I incurred, I should have to pay it. Those those people aren't going to he's going to get nothing from them. So, you know, it's one of those things where um, politically, I think he's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. I think it's bad policy. It adds the deficit dramatically, adds the deficit. And oh, by the way, the federal government taking over the student loan program. So they set the interest rates and can effectively you know, stop payments and tell everybody they don't have to pay was perhaps one of the worst public policy decisions ever made. And it was never even discussed because it was jammed into Obamacare. And it happened as part of the Obamacare bill. And it was mostly not paid attention to, but Congress sets the interest rates on those student loans. 
And that's why the federal government can, in fact, just say, you don't have to pay them back. Of course, if they tell this generation that they don't have to pay them back. How many people who have student loans that are going to school right now are going to plan on paying those back? The answer is a very round number. So that's a, it's really kind of a, uh, an interesting situation. Um, I just really wanted to get on and talk to you all about the, about the poll because I think it is interesting. And um, I hope you found this to be a little bit interesting. If there's a, um, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to send them in to us at uh, media at getliberty.org. Um, I'm working on a story today dealing with uh, well, two things. Um, number one, dealing with the wealth tax. And if you like going, I, I, I did all these numbers and I decided it was too wonky and I cut it up a little bit, but I, I think you'll like it. I think you'll find it interesting. Um, and we also did a statement today dealing with um, a study which showed that China has been Chinese uh, big money investors in China have been uh, st effectively stealing um, from smaller investors, American investors, um, because they're jumping to the front of the line to sell a stock when they because they know that 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 company is falling out of favor with the Chinese government because the markets don't determine who wins and loses in China. The Communist Party of China does. And so those companies uh, get out fat, get out early, saving themselves massive losses and letting those losses be heaped on to uh, people who are, who are in, or buying into mutual funds that have emerging markets like China in them and dominant, dominantly uh, uh, dominant China positions. Those are, the, those are the people who get crushed on these things. Um, the big Chinese investors are getting out, getting out before the dam anybody knows about the damage. And guess what? In China, they don't even have to report it. Um, and to the SEC, there's a special rule, Securities Exchange Commission. There's a special rule where you only have to report the your if you sell your Chinese company. Um, you only have to report when you sell as an insider. You sell Chinese stock um, by paper, by mail. And so they mail in their statement saying, "Oh, we sold. I sold a hundred thousand shares of uh, China Electric or something." And unlike the United States, where it's within two days, an insider sells shares or buys shares, they have to report it within two days as recorded electronically. The Chinese reports end up being mailed in and being paper. They get stuck in a file cabinet. And they don't actually get, so you could go see them at the SEC if you wanted to visit the SEC. But the reality is they end up being a, uh, not really published online for about three months. And so you have no idea when the Chinese investors are getting in or getting out, uh, the insiders getting in and out of a, a, of a uh, asset. And as a result, um, once again, because of different rules for China rather than the United States, by our own government agencies, in terms of the investment community, China can cheat and American investors get screwed. And yet we continue to allow retirement funds, pension funds, um, state government uh, investments to be invested in Chinese assets. It's insane. No one would invest in an asset if they said, you can't actually have an audit and know what's in here. Um, you know, you have everything else audited, but the Chinese assets aren't audited. And you say, so, so who under those circumstances are going to say, well, gee whiz, they have insider trading and you can't audit them. I'm really going to jump on that investment. And yet that's exactly what a lot of the major, um, major funds do. Blackstone by Larry Fink has a massive holding in China. Um, Vanguard has a massive holding in China. And when Vanguard has that holding, that means... If you have Vanguard investments, you have that holding. So you have China exposure unless you choose to do something about it. Um, and if it were me, I'll tell you what I did. I went and said, said I don't want to be in China. I went to the guy, the person who I pay money to invest uh, my meager, my meager retirement. And I just said, I don't want to be invested in China. Too much risk, not willing to assume it. I don't want to fund slave, slave labor. And so get me out of China. 
And the, the person who I was with said they couldn't do it. That they basically had one size fits all. And I said, see you later, dude. And found somebody who would. Because ultimately, each of us is responsible for our own investments. If you're in a pension, you can't do much about it. But any of your 401k, any of your private assets, you have, you have responsibility for that. And knowing what you know now, I think it's time for, for individuals to start divesting from China and letting their investment advisors know that they expect to be divested from China. That's how Wall Street will get the message that it's time to divest from those, from those risky investments in companies that are making, thing, making bombs, making uh, planes and, and trains and, uh, and basically engaging in, uh, in warfare industrial warfare against America and are building the things to kill our, our troops. It's just time to get out of China. It's a bad investment and it's not a, it's not a moral investment. But with that, I'm going to let you go. Um, thank you for tuning in. We will talk to you uh, next time. Um, and yes, we will. That is a great idea um, in terms of handicap. We will be doing that. We will put our contact next time. We'll put our contact in there because I am not uh, not that capable at doing this. So I'll have it set up for me so I can just click on a button and give it to you. Um, and are we coming up on a big recession very shortly? Uh, well, in, in two minutes or less, yes. Um, now coming up is the relative term. Um, when the 10-year treasury bond, the interest rate on the 10-year treasury bond goes below the ten-year, the interest rate on the ten on the two-year treasury bill. Short-term investment costs more than in terms of interest than long-term investment. When that happens, over the last fifty years, ninety-eight percent of the time, there is a recession within two years. Sixty-six percent of the time, there's a recession within one year. That happened in March. So we have a uh, one of the one of the most reliable predictors of a coming recession is that one that I just gave you. Um, two, thirds of, you know, two thirds of the time it happens in one year, 98% of the time it happens in two years, and then 99% uh, of the time it happens in 37 months, 39 months. So yes, the answer is yes, we are going to get a recession um, within the next two years with a, uh, a higher grade of probability than the poll I just gave you. So it's 98%, which means 2% chance it doesn't. Um, and it's, and we are, and quite honestly, that's how inflation is eventually going to get choked, is the economy is going to slow down pretty significantly. Right now, we, while we had 5.5, 5.8, whatever it was, uh, GDP uh, in second and fourth quarter, we are in first quarter, uh, we were looking at a significantly smaller GDP. Um, we we're looking at GDP. So GDP is, is going to be down around zero, between zero and 1% GDP growth. Um, in the second quarter, if things go the way they look like they're going, and it will be, and I predict that we'll start seeing my, I was asked the other day what I thought, and I'll just give you what I thought. I thought third quarter. And then third quarter, we'll have a recession, third fourth, third quarter this year, fourth quarter this year, uh, first quarter next year, second quarter of next year. Um, that's kind of where, you know, my prognosis, but, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, that isn't what I do for a living or a politician. I can tell you what I see in terms of the, the numbers, but so take it with a grain of salt, but the answer is, I believe we will have a recession. I believe it will be fairly rapid, fairly soon. I believe it'll, it'll take about a year to get out of it. And I think, and I think it's going to be difficult on a lot of people. So um, my, in my own internal world, um, we're storing our nuts um, from the, as a squirrel would do before winter, because sometimes it's time to, to to spread and to basically spend the money and the other times it's time to hunker down. And the irony of course, is as people hunker down with expectation of recession, they don't spend. And as a result, it's sort of a self-predicting uh, prophecy 
uh, because of their lack of spending and, and kind of holding their, their spending close to their vest and holding their money close to the vest actually is one of the things that has and causes uh, the economic activity to slow. So it's all, you know, one hand in the other. Um, so that's where we're at. I appreciate uh, y'all being on. And with that, uh, we will talk to you tomorrow. Thank you.